Alright guys, this step we're going to talk about the uh, some of the rotating assemblies. We're going to get the main gear ready to go. We're going to get the clutch fan and hub ready to go as well as tear down and really go through the clutch stack. Um, I apologize, I meant to film me balancing this, this fan to show you how I do it. But I got caught up in the moment, was talking on the phone and just did it. So I apologize. As you can see, I didn't, it didn't take a whole lot to balance, but I always balance it with the clutch mounted. Um, everything already locked tighted, so it's as accurate as it's going to be. So uh, I will. What I will do is put a link in the description of this video to Matt's balance your shit video, which is extremely informative. He taught me how to balance uh, balance the fan and clutch assembly. So uh, I'll just relay that link onto you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and. Um, stop the camera as I said I've already obviously there's no Loctite on the clutch bolts I gotta put the hub on yet but the fans already Loctited to the to the hub uh, but I am going to tear down the clutch belt the, excuse me, the clutch bell and stack assembly and show you everything going on there bear with me okay as you can see I have the clutch stack completely torn down uh, this is a very familiar setup if you've built a, the, an N7 in the past um, I like this setup, it's very straightforward, it's very easy to maintain, The everything comes apart easily to change bearings. Uh, I will note that I have helped a few customers in the past who uh, seem to overlook the importance of these bearings in the clutch stack. Um, when you're, if you have a reason to tear the engine out of your helicopter, you should really check these bearings. Um, they do wear, they spend 16,000 RPM anytime the engine's up to speed, so keep an eye on those. Um, okay, so like the N7, the pinion is changeable. It does come stock with the 16 tooth pinion. Uh, there is a 14 tooth pinion will be available shortly after release uh, for those of us who wish to run it as a 600 model. But the, seven, the 16 tooth for the 550 class is, is included. The star shaft is very similar. Obviously, it is unique to this helicopter because it's a different size. Uh, you can't you run the N7 or the N5C uh, start shaft. It is unique to this helicopter, but the, sh the design is pretty similar. And the clutch bell. Like the N5C and the N7 and the and other Synergy Nitros before it, the magnets for a magnetic RPM sensor can go into the clutch bell, and that's what I'm going to do. I got these two magnets that came with my RPM, top RPM sensor. I'm going to install those now. It's easy to get to. There's nothing in the way. I mean, literally, there's nothing in the way that could cause make it difficult to put those magnets in. So we're going to do that. Uh, there is a pinion nut under this cap that holds the pinion in place. You're going to want to make sure that you Loctite this stuff. Um, in theory, because of the way the engine torques and runs counterclockwise, this connection right here is constantly tightening the whole time. I still put a little blue Loctite on that. Better safe than sorry. It shouldn't ever be able to slip, but I still do it. Definitely Loctite on the pinion nut because it is a... Um, it is a joint that will try to wander loose on its own. Basic, basically, just break it all down, Loctite it all. Be careful not to get Loctite in the bearings. There are several bearings, including a small bearing for the start shaft inside the clutch belt. But you definitely want to Loctite together. Uh, and if you've built an N7 you, or an N5C, you've also seen that Matt has incorporated the RPM sensor mount. In, into the clutch assembly, clutch bell. This one takes it one little one step further. It actually comes with this little threaded elbow that is really convenient for, uh, I, I know the Fataba RPM sensor matches up. Another guy I know is, is uh, setting up his with the Align RPM sensor. You have to flip it backwards and elongate one hole, I think, but it lines up perfectly. So it's a, another simple bolt-on part. Should fit most sensors. I'm going to go ahead and stop the camera and start putting this guy back together and I'll show you what it looks like when I'm all done. Alright guys, there it is. Um, the clutch is fully assembled. I went ahead and since <clears throat> mounting the RPM sensor at this step is much easier than trying to mount it once it's in the helicopter, I went ahead and put it on now. This wire is bundled up nice and neatly, it shouldn't be in the way for when I'm setting the mesh, but it's definitely easier to do this now than when it's in the helicopter trying to reach through the skinny frame. So. Uh, I recommend doing that. Uh, I did go ahead and use red Loctite on this um, set screw for the starter hex. I have unfortunately had a starter hex slip and the start shaft drop down towards the motor and you can't start the hill helicopter out the field. To fix it properly you got to fully pull the, the clutch stack. 
I think it's just good insurance to use red. Don't go crazy on tightening that. You can crack the hex adapter, but uh, it does need to be snug. There is a flat spot on the start shaft. Let it do its job. Now, obviously, the clutch bell should spin freely from the start shaft. You don't want to cram this really tight and then tighten it down. You don't need to overly preload the bearings. Looks pretty good. This clutch stack is ready to go in the heli. Uh, the clutch liner is pre-installed from the factory. There's nothing really to do there. I am going to go ahead and break out my trusty crank lock. And I'm going to show you guys um, how I go about putting the hub on the crank on the crankshaft of the helicopter, on the engine. And then we'll start mounting this bad boy in the helicopter. Okay guys, you can see I have my OS55 here. I've already taken the back plate off. Um, I've seen guys try to do these hubs without taking the back plate off. Um, I don't really like doing that. Uh, I think it's much, very, very wise to invest in a crank lock tool. Matt's making these on his 3D printer. You can buy them in a lot of different shops. It's been around for years. It's not a new concept. Uh, but if you're ordering a kit anyway, you can always throw one in your car with Matt. He'll, he'll send it to you. Um, this particular one is good for the, both the 91 and 105 size as well as the 55 and YS60. It's pretty neat. And the idea here is this goes in the back plate and it provides a soft malleable surface to wedge the, the connecting rod to so that you can tighten the crankshaft and use the, the connecting rod pin to hold the crankshaft in place. Um, if you aren't careful though, the crankshaft can slip and it's there is conceivable risk of damaging the, the skirt on your pistons. You do want to make sure that you have one hand adequately holding that crank lock in place and let the crank lock do the work holding the crankshaft you're just keeping the crank the crank lock from backing out so and then once I have that in place um, it's very 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 important the excuse me engine washer that comes with your engine goes on before the hub then your hub and if you're like mine you may have to loosen the pinch, pinch bolts a little bit from the factory that will go down on there and then you're going to take your crank nut and a socket and spin that down all right now I'm not gonna make you I'm not gonna bore you with watching me tighten everything up but that's the premise use a crank lock tool don't get lazy um, if you to use something to lock the tool, I strongly recommend a crank lock. I know guys have used old toothbrushes. The whole idea is just to use the conrod pin, wedge something in there so it can't turn. So when you're tightening up this crank nut, you're not uh, the, the crankshaft isn't going to turn. Um, the bulk of the work, though, here's the the common misconception. Everyone thinks you need to get this crank nut crazy tight so the hub won't slip. All the crank nut is doing is keeping the crankshaft preloaded against the inner bearing and the hub preloaded against the, the, crank, the crank housing bear, uh, outside bearing. That doesn't take an asinine amount of torque. The real work of this hub holding the crankshaft to the hub are these pinch bolts. Make sure those are good and tight, but don't you don't need to worry about going crazy on the crank nut. All you're doing is actually adding extra preload to the bearings and you're going to increase their wear. Needs to be tight, not crazy tight. These pinch bolts are what do the real work. I'm going to go ahead and stop the camera. I'm going to tighten everything up, get my my ratchet out and snug down this nut, tighten up these uh, these M3 cinch bolts, put my bottom plate back on, and uh, come back. I'll show you what the clutch looks like assembled. Okay, guys, here we are. We are ready to start talking about mounting this engine. I'm going to take you through a couple of things real fast. As you can see, I do have my hub, clutch, and fan fully attached. There's no... Um, glow plug in this engine right now which is why it spins so freely um, but I like to make sure the bearings are tight the, the preloads good it doesn't move in and out one thing I forgot to note when I balance these I actually put a little red mark on the ed edge of the clutch where the where some of the balance holes are that helps get when I reassemble it I balance it with the clutch mounted I want to make sure I clock the clutch properly when I put it back together so that looks what the little red mark goes I even take it one step further and paint the top of the bolt it went on that side red as well. That's probably pretty hard to see in the camera, but the top of that bolt's got a little red tint to it. That way I know that bolt was in that hole, the clutch was in that spot when I balanced it. So it's just keeping everything balanced. 
doesn't undermine the work I did. Cl uh, engine. Before we put in the helicopter, we have to put the shroud on. Pretty straightforward. It's a clamshell design. This guy goes together like this. There are two two millimeter screws, or there are three th two millimeter screws that hold the clamshell together. And then you've got some of these standoffs that get bolted to the shroud. Then those are what actually mount the shroud to the frame. Uh, these are pretty straightforward. There's two different size of these standoffs. The longer standoffs go in the uh, go in the back. The shorter standoffs go in the front. It's really pretty straightforward. I'm going to go ahead and cut the camera and put the clamshell together, bolt on the uh, standoffs, and then I will talk about these shims. All right, guys, the fan shroud is assembled. The standoffs are installed. Um, I think I said it backwards in the previous um, clip, so I'm going to say it again. On the fan shroud, the cooling part that goes down over the head is the quote-unquote front. The longer of the two standoffs go in the front, and the shorter of two standoffs go in the back. Follow the manual, it's very easy to see from the picture, but I think I said it backwards in the previous um, section, so I want to make sure I clarified. As you can see, the shroud moves freely from the engine. It does bolt to the to the frame separately from the engine. That's to allow you to adjust the shroud so that it doesn't contact the hub when it's spinning. Pretty straightforward. Um, the installation of this is a lot like other nitro models. You don't have to take the entire frame apart. Just take the bottom plate off. In our case, we haven't even put the bottom frame bottom plate on yet, so it's nice and easy. Before we do that, I want to talk about these shims that come with the kit. There are four of them, as you will see. Two of them say 16T on them, and two of them say nothing. It might be a little hard to see in the, from the glare. The purpose of these shims, if you are running it in a 5.56 format, running the 16 tooth pinion, you will absolutely for sure need the two 16 tooth uh, one millimeter shims. The reason these two half millimeter shims are in the kit is for whatever reason, I don't know if it's just machine tolerance or if after they cast the blocks on these, when they go to machine the mounting tabs, there seems to be a variance in the thickness of these mounts. So rather than expecting people to manually adjust the mesh on the main gear to fit their motor, Matt's thrown in some extra shims. You may or may not need them. Uh, we've got several of these in testing right now, and it's been about 50-50. It really does come down to the motor you're using. So if you're like me, um, I would, I'm would i going to start with putting all four shims in, check the mesh, make sure my clutch stack is straight. I'll show you that when we get that part. If the mesh is loose, then we will take those two half millimeters out and move it in a little bit and see how it goes. It's conceivable you might need a 0.25 shim to have the mesh be perfect. Um, piece of cake, take a bottle can, bottle can, uh, Coke can and cut some washers. Piece of cake, lots of options. Matt did include some 0.5s in case you need them. You will for sure need the point the 1.0s though if you decide to run it as a 600 you're running the 14 tooth pinion you'll be able to take those two 16 the two one millimeter 16 t branded shims out to get your engine closer to the main gear since the, obviously the pinion will be smaller this part's going to be really hard to show on the camera so what i'm going to do is i'm going to stop the camera and go ahead and mount the engine um, when i come back i will show you the engine in i'll let you know um, what I haven't had not locked tight just yet, and I will um, talk about the clutch a little bit. Bang with me. Okay, here we go. Engine is in, clutch stack is in. Uh, I have not locked tight the clutch stack nor the transmission bolts yet. I've also not locked tighted the receiver tray and the gyro tray. Receiver tray and gyro tray are going to come out when I'm doing my electronics wiring. Just makes it easier to see the wires, so those aren't locked tight yet. Um, and the transmission and the clutch stack, I need to fine tune the mesh, fine tune the, the squareness of the clutch before I lock tight those. But the, everything else is tight and ready to go. Um, next up is the main shaft, the main gear rather. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. There's a couple of new things here. So let me give me a second. I'm going to break this guy down and come back and show you what's new. All right, let's talk about the main gear assembly. Uh, this is the 119 tooth main gear for the, that was first introduced with the E5. It fits this model well. You have a pretty standard one-way bearing hub you're used to seeing. Uh, the first thing that's new is we have a brand new auto rotation gear and a brand new auto rotation hub. This guy right here uh, is helical cut, the machined aluminum center hub. Very, very gorgeous, 
weight shade where it could be, strong where it needs to be, that guy right there is going to be a good addition to this model. I, I'm liking it. Um, the next thing that's new is traditionally Matt has used bronze or brass bushings for either side of the one-way bearing for the main shaft sleeve to glide on. In this helicopter, he's introduced Delrin bushings. Uh, his prototype models had these in it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of flights and the one-way bearings are silky smooth and easier to maintain because of Delrin is held in with a little bit of CA. It comes out a lot easier so I'm looking forward to putting some flights on this. Uh, Matt, like I said, Matt's is working great. I think that's cool of him to think outside the box. Never assume one thing is the permanent fix. Try new things. I like that about Matt. Sleeve itself is pretty straightforward. You also have these two small Delrin shims uh, one goes here on the, on the on the sleeve, and the other goes between the one-way bearing and the auto rotation hub. So that part's pretty straightforward. Uh, both the auto gear and the main gear have four uh, two and a half millimeter screws. We do need to remove Loctite and reinstall. Just make sure when you're reinstalling these, you don't over torque them. There's absolutely zero reason to torque these down tight. You can crack the Delrin. Snug them up, let the Loctite do its job. I'm gonna stop there. Get this. Get the bushings glued in. Get the one. Get the the hubs um, locked on. And when we come back, we'll be talking about setting the mesh. There it is. Main gear is in. <clears throat> Talk briefly about the meshes. Uh, first of all, in the main gear, there is a copper shim that goes between the middle bearing inner race and the top of the sleeve. And then there is a bushing, uh, uh, rather a collar with a with a raised boss on one side that goes between, that goes on the rest on the bottom bearing block. But that shim in there, as you can see, there's no collar's not on here yet. There's absolutely zero up and down play on that. It's sandwiched in there really good, nice and snug. The up, the collar that goes on here, which I'll put on in a second, it's just the security to keep the bearing from walking out. Mesh wise, this is really, really hard to see on camera. You're gonna have to take my word for it. A lot of you have set mesh before. This is a helical joint. It's a darn near zero mesh joint. Uh, it is far more important that the clutch be squared to the engine than this have uh, a, a, a noticeable click. You don't want it to drag. It should be smooth and sound good like that one does. And if you hold the clutch bell, you should have just a little bit of movement, which this one does, feels good. And I have eyeballed this clutch stack from three different directions. The clutch itself does hang about a quarter of a millimeter below the clutch bell so you can see the bottom of the clutch. What I do is I eyeball from the front, the side, and the back to make sure that, that clutch looks square. The start shaft should spin freely of the engine without binding in all sides and the clutch bell should spin freely with the with the main gear. Uh, I am very certain this clutch is square and this main gear mesh feels great so I'm gonna go ahead and lock tight these four clutch stack bolts. The transmission, this is really hard to see, it's a lot of black, but the drive gear is slightly taller than the auto rotation gear, so it does hang just a little bit below the bottom of the gear. Don't worry, it's perfectly fine. You're meshing with all of the gear. This, this mesh is slightly adjustable. Uh, there is like 0.25 millimeters of movement on this transmission. With the 34 tooth gear, you don't want it all the way forward. With the 35 tooth gear, you're gonna want it all the way back. It really depends on which which uh, drive gear you've got there. This guy's pretty straightforward. The very next step is to <clears throat> put the skids on and start talking about the boom, but I'm gonna stop, mount all my electronics and do a little pre-wiring. I'm not going to film that. I'll, I'll, I'll cut the camera back in and show you what it looks like when it's all done, but I'm not gonna take you through mounting electronics. I don't want to bias anybody. I'm going to tell you right now, I love MKS servos. This helicopter is going to have full MKS on it. I told you that on day one video. As far as your exact exact wiring routes and exact uh, fly bars you use and where you put things, so much of that is personal preference. I'm just not going to bore you with my opinions. I'm going to stop the camera, mount my electronics, start squaring some, start um, lining some stuff up, and when we come back, we'll be ready to talk about the head setup. 